Frequency Matters, the RF and Microwave Update Series. I'm Pat Hindle. I'm here with my co-host Gary LaRude. This episode, we're going to take our first look at our big May IMS 5G issue, always the biggest of the year, and this is no exception. Right. So we have extensive coverage of the IMS event. We cover all the conferences, special activities, the exhibition, and we have a big extended new products section because this is a time when a lot of companies introduce new products. Right. So you'll be able to check all those out in there. The cover feature is written by authors from GSMA Intelligence, and they take a look at innovations providing energy savings and power consumption reduction for 5G networks. They did a very in-depth research report called 5G Energy Efficiencies. The green is the new black, and we carry that theme onto our cover as a 5G issue. And in fact, this cover is augmented reality enabled now. Yes. So we're bringing that back. We did it a few years ago, and it was a little bit ahead of its time, I think. So we'll try it again. You just point your camera and frame the cover and it should get a little pop-up and you can experience it right in your browser without having to download the app, which was the way you had to do it in previous versions. Now some older phones, I still think you'll have to use the app, unfortunately. It's a nice animation. Yeah, you get an animation and all kinds of links that overlay right onto the cover. So it's pretty cool. I hope everybody will try it out. Yeah. So what do we have for technical features? Well, as you know, we have a bunch of them. Too many for me to go through all of them, so I'll just highlight a few. We have from Roden Schwartz an interesting article on uh, calibrating a virtual cable, if I put that in quotes, for over-the-air testing of 5G millimeter wave devices. And then Yol Development has an update on the 5G infrastructure market. I found this interesting because they take a little bit of a philosophical approach, contrasting the telecom world with utilities that we think of like water and electricity and showing the differences. Then we have an article from Facebook Connectivity, which is interesting. They talk about combining line of sight and non-line of sight backhaul links to extend uh, broadband into areas that are unserved and particularly those that are geographically challenged. And then lastly, we have from Les Besser, a retrospective on the creation of Compact and Super Compact. And as you know, these were the first programs commercially available for RF microwave simulation. And Les kind of tells the story, this was back in the day when all these programs ran on mainframes and the way that he ultimately brought that to market. And it brought back some memories for me because I think I was the first user of Compact at Texas Instruments using it to do a uh, switched filter design for a missile program. So, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, uh, it was brought back a lot of memories as I went through the article. Yeah, and we'll have an accompanying podcast that we'll release also in May. Yeah. So we had a special guest join us today, Tom Cole. He's Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Integra Technologies. And he joined us to talk about the high power transistor market and a new product that they're bringing in. So let's take a look at a clip from that now. So how is Integra addressing these trends in the marketplace? So for us, I think part of it is the technology that we have developed. So we have a, a very unique pallet solution that uh, we call our pin and socket pallet approach. This is something that we are able to take a existing design for someone in our semi custom approach where we tailor it to their specific frequency and power level, but give them a solution that's actually plug and play. No touch labor required to solder on tabs to the pallets to connect them into the, the larger assembly. They can simply drop in the pallet, bolt it in place, and all of the signal and DC's uh, feeds are addressed through the plug and play pins that we have. And so it's just uh, a registration drop into a, a socketed fixture or socketed uh, a system uh, element, and they're able to, to immediately connect the pallet and go. So for field replaceability and for other ease of use, it's been a really good uh, solution for them. So it's great to catch up with Tom again. He's becoming a yeah. regular on the show. So we hope to have him on later on to see how that new product is doing. So turning to the news, I wanted to continue on the theme of partnerships, which mm. we did in the last episode. And CASE, which is the Cobham Electronic Systems Group, is now announcing a new partnership with Colorado Engineering. And yeah. they'll be working on new communications technologies, data links, missile seekers, all types of technologies. And I can kind of see a strategic uh, trend here. They're picking smaller companies with innovative technologies and bringing them to a wider market. As we had talked about in our last episode, Swiss to 12 is another partner they're working with. Yeah, I think this was a good uh, match too. 
I think that's a great strategy because there's a lot of these innovations um, that you don't really get to see unless they're scaled up and brought to the mass market. Right. And also, and I had quite a few partnerships mm. to announce. They are acquiring MonoDrive and announced a strategic alignment with uh, ANSYS. And they'll be working on automotive safety systems and yeah. autonomy systems with ANSYS. And they also announced a second partnership with NYU Wireless. They're again an industrial affiliate now, and they'll be working on 6G research as they did with 5G. Yeah, I noticed there it's all about terahertz frequencies now. It is. So what did you see in the news? So broadband is an area of interest for me, kind of like 3D printing is for you. So I saw several things there. Comcast has done a lab demo of full duplex using a Broadcom system on chip. And they were able to demonstrate four gigabit per second uh, back wow. and forth, both uplink and downlink. And of course, the DOCSIS 4.0 full duplex specification has been released, and that ultimately calls for a 10 gigabit per second down, 6 gigabit per second up. And then there were a couple of announcements related to the space programs. OneWeb has launched another 36 satellites. They're now up to 182 of their 648 constellation, and they expect to be offering some service to the northern latitudes by the end of the year. And then, of course, uh, SpaceX has been in beta for their Starlink system with something like 10,000 users. But they've now opened it up for pre-orders for the actual commercial launch. And they announced this week that they have more than 500,000 pre-orders, wow. people willing to pay $99 a month for broadband. So that's a nice uh, chunk of money there. Well, it's interesting to see the satellite broadband starting to really take hold. It's been quite a few years we've been talking about it. Definitely. So that's the news that I saw. So uh, turning to events, it's only a month away from IMS. So as everybody knows, it's a hybrid event. It'll be taking place in person the week of June 6 in Atlanta. And it'll be somewhat of a scaled back uh, production, but it'll still be very effective. I think it'll be a very intimate event for everybody mm. and to really get to see what's going on, attend all the sessions that you really want to attend. And sometimes there's just too much to do. And you know, just note that the Georgia World Congress Center is really taking good precautions for COVID. Uh, masks are required, there's cleaning stations, the capacity of all conference rooms will be limited, there'll be contactless badge pickup. So a lot of these precautions will be taken, so if you do visit in person, you should feel safe. Also on site, any of the events that were going to be at a different location have all been moved to the Omni Hotel, which is mm. connected to the Georgia World Conference Center. And that way you won't have to take a taxi or get on a busy bus or anything like that. You can just walk over. And Good. again, there'll be social distancing in these events. Good. So for the virtual event, it will take place two weeks later, starting uh, June 20th. So there'll be a week where everything is broadcast as live in the virtual world. And there'll be the full conference and all the associated activities that go with it. But what's great is then you have a whole month of on-demand use. So you can go in there and you can watch any of the um, conference sessions that you missed or didn't have time to attend. And then there'll also be a full virtual exhibition. So there'll be virtual booths from everybody. You'll be able to converse either via text or Zoom link for video. And what's good about this is the exhibition, even though they may not be there live, it's open all the time. So you can go mm. and visit these booths and look at the brochures and new products and videos at any time that's convenient for you around the world. So that's one thing good about a virtual event. It's not limited by uh, time zones or geography of, in being there in person. Yeah, I think that'll be very convenient. And also I wanted to note in the exhibition side, not only is there virtual booths, but there'll also be a bunch of presentations. So mm. there'll be the micro apps, there'll be exhibitor workshops, which are long format, and then there'll be exhibitor talks, which are short formats, and that's new this year. So there'll be a lot of information on new products and new capabilities on the exhibition side, in addition to the full conference. That's a lot, but it seems like uh, the way they've structured it, for once, you might be able to cover most of the things that you want to see. Yes, it's uh, one time that you can really do that, I think. Well, a couple things I wanted to mention before we wrap up. We have a lot of webinars, I notice. It seems like several every week, plus the panel sessions that you've been organizing. So I want to encourage our uh, viewers to uh, check those out. Uh, you can look at the uh, event section of the Microwave Journal website and see what's scheduled. Also see what's played in the past. And we keep those pre-recorded versions up for roughly six months. So it's a great way for people to explore new technologies, look at adjacent markets, see what their customers and maybe competitors are doing, and uh, really stay plugged into the industry. 
And then the other thing I wanted to mention, if you're not already a subscriber to Microwave Journal, of course, we want to encourage that. I think our publication is a good mix, a Venn diagram, if I can call it that, between the industry, technology, and markets. And it's a good, every issue has informative content in all three of those areas. And uh, it's a good way to keep abreast of what's going on, particularly when we tend to get stovepiped in our own industries. So that's it for this episode. We want to thank our sponsor, Integra Technologies. Welcome them to the program. As you saw in the interview with Tom Cole, they have an extensive lineup of power devices and pallets with high voltage capability and also some unique thermal packaging. So if you're not familiar with Integra, please check them out. Thanks for watching. We'll be back in a couple weeks, our last time before IMS.